Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and welcome to this Bergeron Briefs, which is talking specifically about uh, dealing with tax issues regarding your tax deferred funds. And as I often uh, tell folks uh, when I'm uh, meeting with them, uh, one of the things I love about being at Mariko Connell is there are 70 of us. I get to do what I love, therefore, we all get to do what we love. I like elder law, taxes, not so much. Uh, my friend, Alan Falk is here. Uh, Alan, uh, beca because that's all he does. And he loves this stuff. He just loves it. You talk to him about it, he gets all excited. Uh, so he's even taken some time off actually right now. Um, you, you may not be seeing this, who knows when you'll be seeing this, but it's the beginning, middle of tax season, but he actually took some time off just to talk to us. So Alan, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Arthur, for having me. And yes, it is it is the almost the end of tax season, which is the good news and the bad news. That's, so so can you just once again, for the benefit of our viewers, can you tell tell them how you ended up getting here despite the fact that you're like a tax guy? Yeah. Well, uh, so I've always done tax. I've worked for accounting firms for probably the first 18 years of, of my practice. Um, I'm a CPA as well. And um, the opportunity came up to work at Myrick. I've always wanted to do trust and estate work in conjunction with tax. Um, so it was a great opportunity. And I've been here for about nine years. And my practice is focusing on trust and estates and tax, individuals, corporate, partnerships, trust and estates. So all of my tax trivia questions that I've ever answered to any of my clients really are just parroting Alan Fox. So. Alan, uh, today I wanted to talk specifically about tax deferreds. I know I, I did a, uh, um, a, doing a series of seminars called Elder Law 101 this year. Uh, and in one of them, I talked about tax planning regarding your tax deferred funds. Now I put it in the context of Frank and Mary saying, okay, in this case, Frank and Mary are in their 60s, they're retired, so there's no more income coming in. Now they've got these, this, this pile of money and I talked to him about whether for, for, for later on for um, mass health related purposes, for elder law related purposes, they may want to be trying to shrink down the amount that they have in, in, in tax deferreds so that they can avoid kind of a big one-time hit on tax deferreds. Uh, and perhaps even so that they can do some, some estate planning, some gifting in order to deal with estate planning issues. But, but beyond that, you know, as, as you know, whenever I get anything, any question beyond that, I talk to you. So can you just talk to folks a little bit about if maybe in these situations, what is their relationship between perhaps their 401k, now they're retiring, does that automatically turn into an IRA? What's a Roth? What is, what isn't? And, and what kinds of strategies do you find yourself talking to with, talking about with your, with your tax clients regarding any of these issues? Right, right. So Arthur, I mean, we all work really hard during our lifetime to accumulate assets and have financial security, if you will, through our retirement accounts. Uh, the bad news is that tends to be taxable income when you withdraw it. Um, the, the theory being, you're, first of all, when you put into the 401k or your IRA, it's to grow tax deferred. Um, and you also, in the right circumstances, will get a tax deduction going into it. So the thought is, is that one, it's going to allow you to invest more into your retirement account. And two, it's going to grow tax deferred with the, the cost being when you go to retire, you're going to withdraw it and pay income tax on it. And you may or may not be at a lower tax rate. And I think that's when we'll, we'll get to a little bit, there's, just, there's a potential planning opportunity there. So that's a 401k and that's an IRA. They tend to work fairly similar um, from, a, from an income tax perspective. Uh, when a lot of people retire, they'll roll out their 401k into an IRA. Um, IRAs, you don't have to take what we call RMDs until into the 70s. They used to be 70 and a half, uh, moved it to 72, and it's moving north of 72 now as well. And what's that term, RMD? It's, RMD, so it's required minimum distributions. And when you have a traditional, what I'm going to call a traditional IRA, which is a, which is a non-Roth IRA. So it might have been a 401k that you rolled over into an IRA, or it might have been an IRA that you contribute to over the years. Um, when you get to a certain age, you have to take out minimum distributions. Failure to take out those minimum distributions will result in penalties, and they're fairly severe penalties. 
Um, so you want to make sure that you do take them out when you hit the appropriate ages. Um, one of the other types of IRAs, which some of us are familiar with, are Roth IRAs. Roth IRAs have two benefits. One is it's not tax deferred. If you leave it in the Roth for a long enough period of time, which is five years from when you open the Roth um, and you're over 59 and a half, it will come out tax free. The downside is the money going into the Roth is post-tax, i.e. you've already paid the income tax on the income, which is how it really differs from a traditional IRA or a 401k. The benefit, however, of a Roth is you also don't need to do RMDs. So you can have your Roth accumulate for your lifetime and leave it to your children or to your grandchildren, um, at which time they'll have to withdraw it over a fairly short period of time, um, no longer typically than 10 years. So that's the Roth IRA. Um, one of the things, Arthur, that we see a lot of, as you know, in the practice is we have individuals who have accumulated fairly significant retirement accounts and they need to apply for mass health. So when they apply for mass health, one of the planning techniques is for them to withdraw the IRA and convert it in, in, into an annuity. The problem with that is one, that's all income typically. Two, because it's such a large number in a, in a given year, you really ramp up your tax brackets. So you might go from a 10% uh, tax bracket or a 20% tax bracket to a 37% tax bracket. So that's where one of the planning techniques come into that's really not discussed all that often. And that is, as you're going into retirement, and if, if this is an if, your income is dropping, or maybe you have large medical expenses in any given year, that you review your 401k if you still have one, or you review your IRA and see whether you can take a distribution. Because again, once you're over 59 and a half, you, you can take a distribution and you're not penalized. If you can take a distribution and either A, you're going to pay taxes at a lower rate, or B, it's entirely possible you may not pay any income tax because your deductions are significantly um, would able to offset the income that you, you're receiving from the IRA. Now that sort of flies into the, in the face of what we tend to think of with uh, retirement accounts, and that is you want to leave them alone as long as possible and have them grow either tax-free in the case of a Roth or tax-deferred in the case of a traditional IRA or 401k. However, what you can do is when you take that distribution out, you can then contribute it, you can roll it, if you will, roll it into a Roth IRA, which means you'll recognize the income from the traditional, but the hope is that either you will have significant deductions to reduce that tax, or you'll be paying it at a lower rate. The benefit of, of that strategy is that should you need to withdraw the, the IRA, which is now in a Roth, and it's been in there for more than five years, it is going to come out tax-free, which you would then convert into the annuity. Oh, I didn't, what, the last thing that you just said, I did not know. Well, there were many things that you say that I don't know, but I, I, I didn't, I hadn't heard that, that, that in order for the money that goes in to the Roth to come back out tax-free, it has to have been in there for five years. Well, the account has to have been opened for five years. The Roth, I see. yes. I see, and and so 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 in in some ways that kind of plays into the 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 the, the asset protection strategy that I, I'm often that I'm talking to a lot of folks about. Um, if you're a single person and there is kind of no, it, it, then um, let's see. If you're a single person and and you are trying to qualify for mass health. Then there is this five-year look-back period regarding any um, any transfers um, that oh no no this isn't going to work I'm, I was sorry I, I'm sorry I was losing myself playing trying I should never try to figure stuff out right off the bat when I'm talking to Alan Falk about taxes so so once again going going to the clients that I'm so often talking to I'm talking to typically to my friends Frank and Mary who are trying to figure out how to protect each other. And I'll often tell them, I'll say, well, you know, if one of you needs to qualify for mass health, 
then um, you, you can, while you're both alive, by simply shifting all your assets to the, to the other spouse and then having that other spouse purchase a very specific kind of annuity, a Medicaid qualifying annuity. Uh, but the problem with that strategy, as Alan had mentioned, is typically if you're moving all of the money, if, if, if you have Frank and Mary and Frank is going into the nursing home and he's the one who had the big retirement account, before he can move his money to Mary, he has to make this big payment. So this notion of taking payments out over a prolonged period um, um, in order to reduce the taxes really makes sense. But, not, but I'm hearing Alan saying that there is the, that one of the ways to deal with this may be to put money into a Roth. But in that case, the money has to have been in the Roth for at least five years uh, in order when you take it out for you to be taking it out tax-free. So it's even a greater incentive for folks to really be looking this, at this ahead of time, right? Exactly, Arthur. And I think this is one of the planning techniques that you want to look at as early as possible and keep on your radar screen on an annual basis. Keeping in mind, what are your tax rates going to be in an a, any given year? Um, if, you, if your income drops significantly for one, in one year, that may be opportunity to convert into the Roth or a portion of the IR, traditional IRA into the Roth. Um, alternatively, like I said, and you know, you and I, we have a lot of clients with large medical expenses. So if they've yeah. got the large medical expenses, it might be an opportunity to uh, convert into the Roth because if you don't use the deductions in any given year, they're lost. It, there's, there's no carry forward for certain types of deductions such as medical expenses. So it's really about timing, planning and timing. And, and kind of re-looking at it every year. It's kind of like when I talk to folks about, about being on Medicare. And the nice thing about Medicare is that you, you, know, you want to be re-examining what your Medicare plan is every year because your health may have changed. And, and, and one of the nice things about Medicare, you can change your plan every year looking forward saying, well, you know, if I think I'm going to have more trouble next year, maybe I want to be readjusting. I think you, you want to be thinking about this similarly regarding these accounts. And remember, the time to think about this typically is not April 15th or just before April 15th. It's just before December 31st, right? Because a lot of this movement, is, am I right that a lot of this movement has to happen before December 31st of each year? It does. It does. So I, I'm going to suggest to you to, that earlier in the year, the best to, to look at your situation. And at least have a strategy to review, you know, let's say maybe in October, what your tax situation is going to look like for the year and whether it makes sense to basically accelerate income to take advantage of a lower tax bracket or deductions that you might not typically have had. Now, Alan, I, I have one more trivia question before we go. Um, I, I, it seems to me that I, one of the things, once again, that I not doing taxes all the time, I always talk about to folks is if you've got appreciated assets, typically we're talking about the home, but appreciated assets also like stock, mm -hmm. you want to hold them until you die typically so that at the moment of your death, the so-called tax basis of those assets will jump to the date of death value so that when your kids sell them, they're going to sell them capital gains tax-free. It seems to me that I remember you're saying though that, that it, there's something special about IRAs in this case. Yes, and that's an excellent point, Arthur, and, and a lot of people don't realize this, but IRAs, traditional IRAs and 401ks and, and even certain annuities are what's called income in respect of a decedent. And what that means is that whomever receives the distributions will be subject to income tax. So there is no step up in basis in an IRA, in a 401k. Um, again, excluding the Roth IRAs because right. Um, although technically there's no step up in basis, you're not you don't have you're not taxed when you take a distribution out. So that's a that's a very good point. Um, sort of one of my my pet peeves, and you know this, Arthur, is that when people say, "Well, gift, 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 gift," and they gift appreciated assets, and they lose that step up in basis, that is not the case with uh, traditional uh, IRAs or 401ks. There's always going to be this income tax liability associated with it. Right. So there's no special reason for it for a state tax or for capital gains tax purposes to be holding those assets. So it may, you, once again, you may be wanting to distrib distribute them early. So, Alan, thank you very much for this. I think, you know, I, 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 as I know, as you know, folks, I've been trying to do these kinds of Bergeron brief presentations specifically to deal with 
targeted issues that I, I don't get into in detail in the seminar series. I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you've got any questions on any of this, please, you can give us a call anytime. Uh, you can give me a call at 508-860-1470. Or Alan, what's the best number to reach you? Uh, Arthur, my direct number is 508-929-1649. Alan, go back to doing tax returns. Have a great day. Folks, Thank I you, hope Arthur. you enjoy this. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy this. Please let me know if you got any questions. Thank you.